I'd like to thank all of our sponsors. Our platinum sponsors, Ellis Realty Advisors, A.W. Perry, Atlantic Mechanical Contractors, our gold sponsors, Acela Construction Corporation, Rockland Trust Bank, Jack Conway Realtor, Green International Affiliates, Inc., Axiom Architects, Norell Service Company, our corporate sponsors, Inspired Technology, U.S. Pavement Services, Cape Cod 5, First Citizens Federal Credit Union, Platinum Partners LLC, and Northmark. Welcome to the New England Real Estate Journal and the South Shore Chamber of Commerce South of Boston Real Estate four-part series webinar. I'm Rick Kaplan of the New England Real Estate Journal, and this is week two of our four-part series. Here is our week two panel, and to open up the discussion, I would like to introduce the Mayor of Quincy, who has done an incredible job of transforming the city to be one of the hottest spots south of Boston to work, live, and play. It's an honor to introduce Mayor Thomas Koch. Hey, Rick, and uh, certainly on behalf of the South Shore Chamber and our panelists, I want to welcome everybody to the webinar this morning. Uh, it is a gorgeous morning, and I, I think uh, it certainly feels like we're turning the corner, uh, making our way through this pandemic. Uh, spring is here for new beginnings. Uh, so I, I think that uh, everyone's focus is getting back to uh, some kind of normalcy in life, uh, whatever that may shake out to be. Uh, but certainly I'm glad to be part of this. I appreciate the invitation from Peter Foreman. Thank the work of Courtney and the team on putting this together this morning. We've got a great group of panelists to speak about uh, Quincy South Shore uh, and all the opportunities that South Shore does offer uh, to the region. And uh, I'm looking forward to the discussion, looking forward to the questions and so pleased you're able to join us this morning. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, we are so happy to have you here today and we're very happy to have this um, great panel of, um, of experts in our region. My name is Courtney Biergaard. Uh, I work over at the South Shore Chamber of Commerce and lead some of our South Shore 2030 initiatives. Um, I'd like to take a moment to quickly introduce um, Dave Ellis. Dave has been in the commercial real estate um, industry for many years um, here in the South Shore. He's the managing partner and founder at Ellis Realty Advisors. He will be our moderator today and will set the stage and some context for our region. Um, Dave, I'd like to turn the floor over to you. Awesome. Courtney, thank you so much. Uh, I'd like to echo the mayor's sentiments about the day. It's beautiful and, and we're looking forward to, uh, to, to turning the corner, as you mentioned. And um, Thank you again to the New England Real Estate Journal and to the South Shore Chamber of Commerce for putting on this, uh, this summit and to all the, all the sponsors. So uh, without further ado, let me introduce our panelists that we have uh, today. Um, first, uh, Mayor uh, Tom Koch uh, was sworn in as the 33rd Mayor of Quincy in January of 2008. He has spearheaded an unprecedented number of important public projects, uh, embarked on a widespread program to improve the city's aging and faltering infrastructure, and has tackled many of the city's toughest issues head on. Some of these have earned him recognition at the White House. He pushed successfully for an overhaul of the city's financial systems and zoning code, embarked on a major reform of the city's water and sewer department, and his policies have bolstered the economic vitality of the city and region more broadly, and his leadership has brought a renewed energy and vibrancy into the city's downtown and neighborhoods, which we can see. Um, Susan uh, Perry O'Day is the uh, president of A.W. Perry. Um, uh, Susan was appointed president of the company in October 2020. And in this role is responsible for oversight of the overall strategic direction and operations of the company. A great granddaughter of the company's founder, Susan has served on the company's board of directors for more than 20 years. Over her 35 year career, she's also served in senior management positions with Bristol Myers Squibb, CSX, and most recently retired as Executive Vice President and Chief Information Officer at the Walt Disney Company. Jo Joe Grata is uh, CEO of Atlantic Mechanical. Um, he is on the Executive Committee and Co-Chair of the Housing Committee at the Social Chamber of Commerce. He is current CEO and General Counsel of Atlantic Mechanical. He also runs Grata Property Management and Development, which recently completed the Weston Park Project in Wayne Atlantic. Thank you, panelists, for being here. This is uh, this is really fun. It's going to be a great event. Um, 
So um, I'd like to turn our slides over if we can. We're going to be talking um, about so the South Shore region. What is, uh, what is the South Shore? Um, and what are the attributes that, that the South Shore brings? Um, wh why do people move here? Why do companies locate their businesses here? So a few of the uh, themes that you're, you're going to hear today repeated um, are definitely going to be zoning. Um, there are going to be transportation uh, and there'll be infrastructure uh, discussion. Um, so what, what is the South Shore? Well, the South Shore is comprised of 25 cities and towns uh, spanning from Quincy uh, to Plymouth. Um, in, our, uh, in our region, we've got 22 uh, public transit stops uh, between ferry, uh, commuter, T stations, um, not to mention multiple bus lines run by the MBTA, GATRA, and other private carriers. Uh, in terms of uh, major uh, transit corridors, um, you have these transit corridors listed on this. Um, I'm not gonna go over each one of them. We're gonna talk about them as we kind of uh, meander our way through uh, the region as we talk about uh, some of the development hubs across the region. Um, uh, in our region, there are 15 uh, or more uh, large uh, office, commercial, industrial business parks. Um, throughout that uh, uh, introduce commerce into the, the, the different regions. And we're gonna be talking about those parks as we go through. Uh, there's five uh, major retail centers uh, uh, or malls, uh, eight campuses um, for colleges and universities that they call the South Shore home, uh, five world-class healthcare systems, a wide network, uh, urgent care, uh, and then uh, our restaurant scene is vibrant um, with over 150 restaurants spanning Quincy to Plymouth. Um, and not to mention that the, the cultural resources that we have uh, in a coastal, uh, coastal region um, and hundreds of miles of walking trails and hiking trails. So uh, without further ado, we're gonna start in the, uh, the Plymouth, uh, Plymouth area and we're gonna work our way north. Uh, starting in, um, in South Plymouth, um, one of the, uh, the, the major developments happening there is uh, uh, Redbrook, which is a 1,400 acre um, site plan for about 1,200 homes. Um, miles of walking trails, open space. It's, it's built as a, really a New England village uh, development. And if you haven't got a chance to, to really um, to, to take a look at this project, it's a really interesting, uh, very cool um, uh, project that brings open space and a village feel um, to, to South Plymouth. Um, as we move our way up, um, you know, Route 3, um, one, one piece of infrastructure I wanna talk about is Route 44, um, which back in 2005 was realigned um, to, to create this junction of uh, Route 44 and Route 3. And that really spurred development uh, with regards to some of the um, uh, the business parks, malls in and around that area. Um, uh, most notably, uh, Colony Place, which is a 300 acre master plan, mixed use, uh, live work play development. Um, Colony Place has gone undergone some recent additions um, to not just being an open air uh, retail center, but also uh, uh, 224, 55 and over active adult community was just built by Thorndike development there called Sawyer's Reach. Um, which, uh, and, and then in addition to that, on the Kingston side of the uh, development, there's an additional 100 acres uh, of undeveloped uh, commercial uh, property uh, that, that sits, which um, has been built for different types of uh, commerce, business park, industrial park, uh, as, part of that, uh, as part of that development. Um, moving a little bit farther north, um, I wanna talk about, uh, I'm sorry, Courtney, could you go back? I'm still in, I'm still in uh, Kingston. Um, we're going to talk about uh, the Kingston commuter rail station. Um, a part of that commuter rail station, where, being where it is in close proximity to Kingston Collection, uh, has spawned a, a, a new project called Alexin, which is being developed by uh, Trammell Crow as part of the Kingston Collection at the former site of the Sears Big Box. 282 units, um, again, live, work, play, um, transit oriented. Um, again, uh, some more themes that you'll be hearing as we go through the South Shore. 
Um, in the Plymouth Industrial Park, um, again, uh, getting closer to full development in that industrial park. Um, you're also seeing new industrial uh, development, which we're going to talk about um, with, with Amazon and their 100,000 square foot uh, last mile distribution center on uh, Prestige Way, which is right on the Kingston Plymouth line. Um, moving a little bit to the east, we, um, we have uh, the Cordage Commerce Center. Um, Cordage Commerce Center is an interesting project. It's really um, a confluence of industrial, office, retail, uh, residential, um, and there, there's a marina. Um, so that project uh, is, is 350,000 square feet of transit-oriented campus and marina. Um, uh, again, most notably, the Harbor Walk apartments uh, were just built on the former site of the, the Walmart uh, in their first phase. They have 155 units uh, currently built with another uh, 145 units planned or under construction uh, by Cathartis and Janco Development. Um, now we can move a little bit farther north, Courtney, to, uh, to, to Marshfield and Pembroke. Um, uh, in Marshfield, we've got Enterprise Drive, um, Enterprise Park, uh, which is a 140-acre uh, master plan site. Um, a little less than half of that has been undeveloped. Um, the, the master developer in that is Veraki Realty Trust. Um, the interesting part about this project is it's it started to uh, really develop with the widening of Route 139 and the signalization of Route 139. And, and those efforts uh, were, were really championed by, by the South Shore Chamber um, about five, six years ago. And, um, and now we're seeing the fruits, the fruits of that labor. Um, most notably in uh, Enterprise Park is Modera. It's a 248 unit uh, residential development. Um, and there's also some new roads, some new infrastructure for retail uh, and industrial uh, going in uh, and planned uh, over the next 12 to 24 months. Uh, moving over to, uh, to Pembroke, we've uh, got some development recently with uh, Brigham uh, and Women's and, and Harbor Medical. They're, they're 30,000 square foot uh, medical office building. Um, Corporate Park's another example of uh, the transition of the industrial park. And you see that theme across the South Shore where You've got uh, industrial parks that have really transitioned to full service, uh, more amenities, more medical, more retail, um, and even to some extent, um, residential coming into uh, some of these industrial and, and, uh, and business parks. Um, shifting a little bit farther east into uh, the coastal uh, community of, of Situate, um, I want to point out a project um, at the uh, the Greenbush commuter uh, commuter line uh, commuter station. I'm sorry. The um, the residence is at Driftway Place. Uh, there's a 78 unit uh, project uh, again transit oriented right next to Greenbush. Um, uh, some some mixed use component, 8,000 square feet of retail, smart growth. Um, so again, these um, these infrastructure projects that have happened over the the course of the last. 10 to, to 20 years in, in the South Shore have really made a huge impact in terms of what can be developed. And, and zoning plays a big role in that as we're gonna hear, hear some more from our, uh, from our panelists as well. Um, moving a little bit farther north, I just wanted to point out one project in, in Hull that's, that's, that's new um, as the Paragon Boardwalk, which is a more of a retail amenity um, uh, project that's uh, taken place over the last couple of years. There are some new plans for a uh, 120 unit uh, apartment complex uh, and at that location, which is really uh, amenity driven. Um, and then uh, shifting a little bit farther west to Hingham, um, we've got the, uh, the Cove, which is a 220 unit uh, project uh, on 12 acres within close proximity to, to Hingham Shipyard. And, uh, and close proximity to the Hingham Ferry Service, which obviously um, has been a big uh, uh, issue that, w that the Chamber uh, continues to, uh, to champion and, and bring, light, uh, bring light to. And I know that um, uh, my colleague Susan O'Day, one of the panelists, will be talking a little bit more about Hingham, so I'll save that. Um, so moving over, Courtney, to, uh, to Hanover, if we could. Um, 
probably the, the largest project in terms of uh, in terms of scope in the region, especially from a retail standpoint, is uh, Hanover Crossing. <clears throat> Hanover Crossing is a six hundred thousand square foot open air shopping center, uh, which will be anchored by Market Basket uh, Prep Property Group is the uh, the developer there. Um, and there's also a residential component, uh, 297 uh, high-end residential units developed by uh, the Hanover Company. Um, and this was all made part uh, possible as part of the, um, the village overlay district in the town of Hanover. Um, so again, another uh, area where uh, zoning played a, a critical factor. And um, the other critical factor here is infrastructure, the, uh, the road widening. Um, of Route 53 um, and some of the bridge work that was done, which I, I think we all have some some PTSD still from uh, from the last uh, four or five years of uh, uh, of that project. Um, so, what that does for us, it opens up projects like uh, uh, the Hanover Crossing project across the street. There's uh, been some talk and discussion. Uh, conceptually of a um, uh, mixed use uh, or corporate campus uh, by Unicorn Realty on the other side of Route 53. And, and that would be made possible by, you know, zoning, by infrastructure, um, and having these, um, uh, these, these projects uh, completed. Um, Gordon, if we can go to Norwell and kind of point out, uh, sorry, we can point out Accord Park just really quick in passing. Um, uh, Accord Business Park, um, which uh, is adjacent um, to, to Route 3, um, is a development, um, uh, potential development site, uh, master planned uh, development site where the um, Metropolitan Area Planning Council has discussed uh, with the town of Norwell uh, doing some studies. They've got some ongoing studies uh, doing some potential overlay. Uh, and, and, and inclusive of that would be um, some mixed use uh, development, some potential traffic mitigation. Um, and you've seen uh, some of these projects, the traffic mitigation widening um, really assist as I've talked about. And I know that Susan O'Day will talk about with uh, regards to Derby Street and how that's really set off some development in Hingham as well. Um, with that, I, uh, I'd I think I've taken up enough time here, so I wanted to turn. Uh, I'd like to turn over the uh, uh, the discussion to our panelists, and I'd like to invite Susan O'Day, um, president of AW Perry, to offer some overview of the projects uh, with with her company. That's great, Dave. Thank you so much. Um, like any Zoom call, there's always a you know imminent disaster about to happen digitally, and so I just got the alert that my battery is about to die. So I am on crutches for recent foot operation, but I will be able to get through this, and then I may put my screen off. So it's not to snub anyone in the audience; it's so that I can go run get my power cord and not lose you. But I think I have enough juice to get through this this initial part. But Thank you, Dave, and obviously the mayor and Joe. This is um, always a thrill to be on these. And, and I've learned so much every day uh, from everyone, both you know that I'm getting to know through the chamber and within the region. Um, I'm just recently back, as Dave said, about the last six months back in the South Shore, um, leading A.W. Perry. And I continue to be amazed at the resource uh, resources available and the richness of the area. I'm from Situate. Um, but have been away a fairly long time. So I'm gonna take just a few minutes and drill in uh, slightly more into sort of the Northeast corner of Plymouth County. And um, that's where A.W. Perry um, it ha has some projects. And I thought I would just step back a tiny bit and talk a little bit about the area. And um, so maybe, maybe Courtney, you could flip up the slide. Um, you know, so this area obviously has a very rich history, which we're all familiar with, um, going back, way back to the 1600s. Um, if you're in the, in the South Shore and you start a conversation with somebody from the South Shore, almost 100% of the time, I guarantee you the conversation about where are you born will come up. Um, I was born in Situate and Weymouth and Hingham, whichever. Um, and the reason that's not about status, that's not about class, but that's about is really pride of place. Um, these communities here were really the communities that built and fed Boston. I mean, so there's a rich history of seafaring, tough and ready New Englanders um, that have been through a lot. And over the last really 30 years, and, and we were talking in the pre 
time about the work that's happening in Quincy in the last, say, 15 to 20 years, beginning to really understand, um, you know, what it's going to take to continue to thrive. And we have to not lean on our past, but really lean into the future. So I thought I'd share um, a couple um, highlights. Um, so obviously rich history, beautiful natural environment. I'll show you a picture in a moment of our development park. And what strikes you about the South Shore is it's just vast beauty. You don't realize how much land there is um, to enjoy as residents, but also um, opportunities to build. And many of our industrial parks that you'll see are these very bucolic um, areas. They're not slabs of concrete with a bunch of warehouses. They really are areas where residents can go, they walk through, they enjoy the, the space. Um, towns have been thoughtful not to ruin their own towns with many of these industrial um, build outs. Very unique transportation. You know, we have the ferries that get you into Boston. We have obviously mass transit and various stops that Dave highlighted. And then um, we have a very rich um, and burgeoning bus routes that are so important, both private and public. Um, Peter is um, often, Peter Foreman, chairman of the South Shore, is often quick to remind us that many of the leaders in the South Shore and people that work in the South Shore have this deep entrepreneurial spirit. Many of them came out of Boston or other major cities and said, you know, I'm kind of done with that. I want to build and set roots in this area and build my businesses. And so you have obviously with Joe and Dave and others, these folks who are really building South Shore businesses that have grown to be very successful and don't have sort of the, the broad stresses of being in a downtown area, but have all of the quality um, leadership and people working on it. So again, the town's very much focusing on the future. Um, and so if we could maybe flip to the, to the next slide. So this is an example, as you come down Route 3, if you were to take an aerial view and just fly down Route 3, this is gonna be a typical view where you have huge areas um, of open land that's yet to be either developed or, um, or uh, taken into either residential or commercial use, which is a beautiful thing. And I think that's unique about the South Shore. This happens to be A.W. Perry. I mean, this is you know, an opportunity to highlight what we do. And so I've, I've chosen to, to highlight where we are, but I think you know, Bristol Brothers just to the North of us and other developers that have been mentioned um, in Norwell, there's th these beautiful areas like this that, that um, uh, towns are, are really looking at what to do. We've been fortunate in that um, A.W. Perry has seen and been able to work with towns like Rockland and Norwell, um, where we're able to work um, proactively and partner to imagine the future and think about what could this land be used for? What is it that the town needs? Most of them have now undertaken their strategic planning and not surprisingly, the common thread through all of them is housing, growth, economic growth, economic development. And so developers are, we have found in many of the towns, a welcoming opportunity to partner with them to think about what are the zoning changes required? What would meet their needs and their town constituents' uh, future needs, as well as provide economic platforms for developers to come into the area um, and build out. And so, and, in, and I wouldn't say in return, but in collaboration, we also have been able to work to identify what are the core infrastructure elements. And those will continue to be um, challenges for all of us on the South Shore, but what are those core infrastructure elements that we can together as the business community and municipalities, whether it's individually or on collective basis, um, approach the state about doing some investment in the roadways to really open this up um, to both promote the vision for the state that's in place as well as these local towns. So um, it, it's, it's, it's pretty exciting. So um, A.W. Perry, we were founded in 1884. So as you know, said, I'm the fifth generation leader of the company. Um, so my great, great grandfather founded the company. We're out of Rockland originally. Our properties primarily were in Boston until the 1920s where we started to develop and build um, in our own hometown of Rockland, a, a stronger footing um, with some properties. And then in the 1960s, th through, uh, we were able to put together the assembly um, that's on the screen here. It is largely industrial, used for light, and was at the time used for light industrial and warehouse development. Um, through that time, um, we've been able to uh, really attract some pretty marquee um, companies into the area. Um, largely because of much of the culture that comes from the, the surrounding communities, as well as within the, the Rockland and Hingham, which this park straddles. Um, we've invested about a quarter billion into this park over the last little about 20 years, um, shy of 20 years. And we're home to EMD Serono, 
um, North American home for EMD Serono, a, a major pharmaceutical company, Blue Cross Blue Shield. We have a, a, a terrific brand new, uh, fairly brand new, I guess it's a, a few years old now, BMW dealership. Um, we have healthcare, as Dave indicated, many of these industrial parks have now grown and been repurposed for greater use. And we have the world-class um, orthopedic center at the northern end of the park, um, which really attracts people from all over the region and is affiliated, of course, with South Shore Hospital. Um, and so we've really been able to take up the individual value of these properties by increasing the value of the use, but never losing um, sight of the roots. And so our founders said, establish and maintain enduring business relationships by being personally involved in knowing and meeting the needs of each tenant. We still have many, many tenants that we value highly that are running warehouses and running local businesses, whether it's plumbing, plumbing supplies, um, you know, local gyms, things of that sort. So you have in the South Shore this beautiful blend of large scale and local. And that balance is what folks like uh, Mayor Koch and others help work with developers like us to find that right balance, make it a beautiful place to live um, and sustain um, the economic opportunities. So if you could flip to the last slide, um, I'll just go through and do a you know, sort of unabashed advertisement for A.W. Perry. Um, so we have um, you know, multiple properties. These are just examples of properties that we've done. The upper left is just an example, aerial view of some of the portfolio of the built to suit that we've done. We have a beautiful class A um, property here in Hingham that is ready for occupancy as a redevelopment of an older building that's now basically a brand new, um, very high-end um, office uh, uh, for uh, tenants. We have the Brio that just finished over in the shipyard, which is luxury condos. We have just a few units left, so form the line now if you're interested, but just a few units of the luxury condo left. We do build single, um, single family, single units that we've built across Marshfield and Duxbury, projects that are potentially in Duxbury built in Marshfield. Um, have a wonderful project in Norwell, where again was a wonderful, uh, great partnership with the town to think about how to use zoning and repurposing of an exist of a um, legacy um, Air Force base. So, uh, or Coast Guard base, sorry. And then in the middle is just the vision for um, the land. And, and I think it's key, as Dave said, repurposing potentially for mixed use. And so we currently are working with Rockland right now and their um, uh, zoning board and their strategic planning. And they're doing, um, have submitted um, just recently um, a zoning proposal as part of the annual meeting to allow for greater use of um, what was light industrial along Hingham Street um, at the right side of this chart, which would allow for greater grocery store potentially, far, um, pharmacies, apartments, things of that sort, um, but multifamily units. So we're very excited um, at the future of the South Shore and have found many of the towns very welcoming. There are challenges, of course, um, as Judy said in the last, Judy Barrett said in the last session for those of us that were on, some of the towns are very progressive and some are not. And so, but there are more that are progressive than are not today than there were 10 years ago. And so we're finding a wonderful communities, wonderful communities to work with and openness to really do many of these developments. So I think that's it. And then I'll, I'll kind of um, leave it to the Q and A later and we can get into more details and I'm gonna run get my power cord. So, but I will be listening. <laughs> I was waiting for your screen to go dark. I, me too. So I, I, it's a good thing I speak quickly. So apologies. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Susan. That was fantastic. Um, learning about the projects and some, again, some of those themes that, that keep coming back. Um, so at this time, um, I'm going to invite uh, Joe Grata, uh, CEO and general counsel to uh, Atlantic Mechanical to talk about some of the, the neighborhoods and uh, ongoings in the city, the town of Weymouth. Here we go. Awesome. Dave, thank you. Appreciate it. Um, I have the immense pleasure of going over the uh, development hotspot, specifically Weymouth, which is, I think, a great example of some of the things that we've already talked about. Uh, all of the little pieces that, uh, that everyone else before me has mentioned. This is a town that has now embraced most of those things in order to better strategically put itself in a position to succeed. So we're going to see why developers are moving into this area and why this is an important spot and why these things all work together. So if we just go to the next slide. Uh, this live, work, play environment, which we're going to see over and over again, these words are going to repeat themselves. That along with transit-oriented development, you're just going to hear again and again and again. Uh, this is from an article last year. 
Uh, essentially, what we're coming down to is now buildings are looking for not just containing their people within whatever amenities they can put together. It's more about a community. People want to be able to walk around. People want to be able to go to walkable neighborhoods, something that's where there's retail restaurants, something to do. They have a, a substitute for work has been actually the, the transit oriented component. So instead of having to necessarily work nearby, they have the ability to then get to work and commute without having to climb into their car. So that, that, that's particularly big when you talk about the South Shore, when you talk about Boston, we're notorious for our traffic. So it makes a lot of sense that development would surround the transit oriented areas, those, those particular T stations, whether it be the commuter rail, the red line or otherwise. So that, that's huge. And, uh, and Weymouth has a particular advantage in that area because there are three stations that are on the commuter rail itself. So those zones end up being developed as a result of that. So we can go to the next slide here. Uh, so Weymouth itself has not so much a single town center and then a surrounding residential area, but three village centers or multiple village centers. So they're almost like smaller town centers spread about, almost all of them surrounding commuter rail locations. So in the landing, which is a project we just completed, we had a 42 unit building that was constructed upon Weston Park. Uh, it, we, we filled that up almost immediately, very quickly. We added a, a, coffee, so a coffee shop and cafe uh, with a beer and wine license and outdoor space. Uh, and, and all of this was made possible in part because of the zoning they had adopted in that area and because of the, the transit that's nearby. So the live, work, play component continues to play a part. We have people who want to move there because they can go outside to the park that was constructed new by the town. And then they be able to walk to the commuter rail where they can get to work. And then we have our, our coffee shop downstairs, along with many of the other places that have been built around and developed. You know, the funny thing about development, the way that this tends to work is it's almost like a uh, it's almost like a joint conspiracy between the, the sort of public policy, public investment and then a series of private investors. So the concept between live, work and play isn't that there's one building that you're doing it. It's that there are a series of in, uh, developers that are deciding to do the same thing at the same time. And having public investment and zoning encourages those things to happen in, con in congruence with one another. And that's huge because it, it, it actually augments each other. There, are, I see other buildings going up near mine and I want them there because that first level that's going to be retail restaurant or whatever it is, a small market, anything enhances the experience for my tenants. And then all the other developers think the same thing. So as these zoning laws come in to help us and as this public investment for say parks or libraries or schools, whatever it might be where the public sector is doing their part, we are all benefiting at the same time, including the tenants that are moving into these spaces. So as we go along this list here, we see that highway access, proximity to Cape Cod, and the high expense of Boston living is now playing a big part in where South Shore has an opportunity to be able to take on many of the younger couples, 25 to 35. This demographic shift that's taking place is going to happen no matter what. The question is whether we as a community, the South Shore or otherwise, and this is what South Shore 2030 does well, is going to better accommodate the needs of these people so that they come to these communities. So if housing is accommodated, then working will be, playing will be, all these things will come with it. So it's important that we, we look towards filling the gap of these 135,000 units that need to be filled in these next few years. And with South Shore, some places embracing it, Weymouth's an excellent example of that. Others haven't been. So it's important that they look to, to Weymouth and others to see the sort of benefits that have come with it. Now, the public investment and amenities here, we look at Weston Park, Lavelle Field, Osprey Overlook Park. These are all places where there's development surrounding it, and it's no coincidence. We can't look at this and say this has happened by accident. Chapman Middle School, which is going to be, I think, one of the, the nicest and most expensive middle schools in, in the state of Massachusetts, is now in the process of being built. Tufts Library is adjacent to Weston Park. There's a reason why this is a huge benefit. This is a work component as well. They have 15 workstations. They have uh, uh, six uh, um, uh, conference rooms that can fit between, I think it's six people and 50 people, depending upon your needs with projectors and a state-of-the-art media center. I mean, these are all huge components that encourage people to move to this area, especially with this new world of remote, remote working. You're having people now realize that you can be efficient and work from home. So some of these larger companies coming out of Boston or, or, or nationwide, you know, my girlfriend works for Google. So, you know, that's a company that's going to allow them to do a mixed approach for when they come back into the office. So to be able to go to a private uh, office space, and that's going to become an amenity in many buildings moving forward, that's going to be a huge benefit, a huge benefit to have a place like Tufts Library to go. So you don't have to worry about your cat or your dog running in front of your Zoom meeting. Uh, so the zoning changes are also some of the biggest pieces here. I, I cannot credit enough 
of the town government in Weymouth that has, has changed some of the zoning so that we have been encouraged to build there, which has made a huge difference. Uh, and that's not only encouraged me to build in some places, that's perfect, go to the next slide. Now let's see it. So this is some of the investment they've made. Uh, you'll see the sort of a rendering of the Chapman Middle School over the bottom right, the Tufts Library, which is complete and over nearby Weston Park. And then you see the new baseball field in Weston Park itself over in the top left and Lavelle Field in the top right. So this is all things that we now see development surrounding. And you can actually see the buildings over in Weymouth Landing here that have built themselves around the park. So it's no coincidence, you know, people want to go outside. Many of these young couples have pets. It's a, it's a great thing to see these people to be able to experience what is a backyard experience, but also maintain kind of the urban environment that they want to live in. So you have this micro urbanization factor taking place in places like Weymouth Landing in, uh, in uh, sort of the um, uh, commercial overlay district that now exists up and down Route 53 and Route 18, and then Jackson Square, which appears to be the sort of next area where that type of development is going to take place. So you can go to the next slide. So this is why Weymouth is succeeding in the way that it has and very much following the lead of Quincy in a lot of ways, because they've done a great job of being able to approach town planning strategically instead of reactionary. So it's not haphazard. There's a reason why they're doing these things. The village overlay district existed in Weymouth Landing. This has allowed this area to build up as well as it has. The historic mill district is now right next to and adjacent to uh, where Jackson Square is, which has allowed the retention of 44 Mill Street, uh, excuse me, Wharf Street, which has allowed the, uh, uh, this now historic building to be developed into something with a walkable path straight to the commuter rail. It's an awesome project adjacent to the Overlook Park. I mean, you're talking about all these things working together perfectly. The Commercial Corridor Overlay District, which I think is fantastic, has allowed for everything around the Route 18 area, uh, particularly next to Union Point. We're doing a, seeing a series of projects over there, the Aeronaut, the Mio. These are all projects that now have first floor resident, excuse me, first floor retail components that are now walkable to other spaces. We have a CVS over there, a multitude of restaurants. These things are great. Now, the town is currently studying Columbian Square, in, in, uh, which is another zone that I think is going to develop in the Route 3 corridor. And they're looking in the very near future to do Jackson Square rezoning. And I think that's, again, transit oriented. You're right next to the other commuter rail. I think that's going to, to be a huge uh, spot for investment. You're going to see a lot of changes take place over there. Again, adjacent to another park. That's where uh, Level Field is. We're going to see a lot of people move to this area because it's going to be extremely walkable. And it's built to be that way. So this is with Weymouth being able to look at this from a strategic component and making these plans. And, and part of this too comes from, you know, there are fears that this is going to uh, overdevelop and interfere with the residential districts. What this allows Weymouth to do is to collect a higher tax revenue from the areas that can be developed, encourage people from younger communities and demographics to move to the town. And then most of my tenants, I'll tell you, will be with me for two years and they'll go buy a house in Weymouth because they love it. And this is how we get a younger community. And this is how we get a younger community that is, is, is socially mobile as well. These are people that have good jobs that are trying to build families. And from there, Weymouth has been able to increase its minimum lot size in residential districts because of what they've been allowed to do within their village centers and their commercial districts. So this is almost enabling a better town overall for the residential areas as well as the individual village districts and commercial districts. So these things can work in concert. And this is what I mean by strategic. It's important that the, the town sees the long-term future and not just reacts to what's happening directly in front of them. So they're doing a great job of being able to incorporate all of these concepts in one place. And that's why we're willing to be able to work with them here. So let's go to the next slide. So let's take a look at Weymouth Landing. That's my building there in the front. That's no coincidence. Uh, it is my presentation. Uh, but if you see everything developing down there, you'll see a series of new buildings up here in the, in the foreground. Uh, we have Metries building this 12 units there. And then uh, further back on the Braintree side, uh, is landing 53 with 176 units. And there's a series being built in the middle. Uh, this is great. There's a lot of awesome projects here. There are restaurants, there are bars. I move into my building because of how much I like this area. And if that's not an indication of how beneficial these things are, I don't know what is. But again, they changed their zoning and we adapted to a place where now I can walk to Open Doors Yoga on one end and then I can walk to Bates Sports Bar on the other. So this, this puts me in a position where I don't have to take my car out every day. I happen to work five minutes down the road at my office. I know a series of the tenants will walk to the library, which is just under this picture, to be able to do work there. So this is just how you can actually now live your life within these square miles and then still be able to get to work without being worried about an hour and a half of traffic each way and building that frustration of sitting in your car. Life gets easier. Life gets fun. This is, this is what we're trying to do. It's improvement. All right, let's go to the next stage here. 
So the landing, why this works. These are the home, these are the places that are being built out. Weston Park, 10 Front Street, uh, 165 Washington, Landing 53, and Brook Point. We'll get into the actual numbers of those in a couple slides. Now, how the work component comes into play is the commuter rail right there and then the Tufts Library. We know over the importance of these, these, these facilities. And then play. This is just a list of things you can do that you can walk to. These aren't even things that, that uh, you know, that, that you can drive to within the South Shore, within the other communities. Keep in mind, you're now five minute to 10 minute drive to each one of these other village centers where they have all this other entertainment. And that's encouraged. You know, there's parking here because we have the space to be able to do that. This allows for people to now, you know, add, add commerce to sections they wouldn't normally have access to. So we'll go to the next one. Great. So Route 18 and the commercial corridor overlay district. So they foresaw that Route 18 and Route 53 were their largest commercial overlays. They expanded Route 18, which was fantastic. Anyone who's driven that span of time while they were doing work or before that has realized how much of a difference it is to now have just two lanes on both sides going all the way down. It's super easy. So you are seeing a ton of development happen in these areas. As a result of that, again, a walkable, livable area surrounding a transit oriented zone. So we'll go to the next slide and you can see why these four projects are huge union points, its own animal, but it's adjacent. So there's a, a commuter rail right there. Social hospitals down the street, the social bank headquarters is right there. And then they're, they're adding an assisted care facility in the general zone. I mean, there's plenty of things to do over here. You get a farmer's market, nature trails, dog park. Uncle Charlie's is right in the middle of the whole thing. We have stockholders right down the street. I mean, being able, and, and the more of these developments are, and these are at their nascent stages, these are just being filled now, only a couple have been finished. But once these are done, you're going to see a lot more people there, which then creates a lot more play. And there's a lot more uh, bars, restaurants, things to do that result from people being there. So like I said, it's sort of a, a, an unintended mutual unspoken conspiracy that takes place among private development, among restaurateurs, and then among the public, uh, the, the public community that's, that's adding some of these things that's making it attractive for developers to get in here. We'll go to the next one. So these are the results. This is what they've seen. Um, I've highlighted my project. It's the one I know the most about. And uh, I think, again, the most significant and beautiful of all of them. Um, kidding. kidding. Many of these are, are they're from much more experienced developers than me, and they've done an absolutely fantastic job. And it makes it easier for me to want to be a part of this community by looking at some of these other places that enhance both the experience and the cosmetics of the neighborhoods. But you were looking at 1,100 units being added or have been added or partially over this span of time. And all of these, you're seeing a commercial component go into almost every single one of them. So this is huge. You're talking about adding amenities for the individual neighborhoods, while we're also taking into account places to live. So this is 1,100 units here. Those that are already in service locally, there was a recent study done where 1,100 of the units that are already there have a 95.7% occupancy. So that's well above the, uh, the standard average. As a developer, you carry 10% vacancy. Uh, we're seeing not even close to that. I mean, I think I'm 99% pretty much over the last five months, but it's, it's incredible. There's still an ongoing demand. So any concern thinking that maybe we're overdeveloping in this zone, we're actually just catching up to the inventory that we've needed over this span of time. We've seen so many uh, um, young professionals find, uh, unable to find housing in these areas on the South Shore. So this has been huge. Let's go to the next one. So near future hotspots. Uh, these are the areas that I think we're going to see developing. This is in Weymouth. So we have Jackson Square. So we have zoning changes we know are coming. The Mill Overlay District is nearby and again, walkable to this zone. And then we're right directly next to the commuter rail. And, you're, and if you take a trip through there, you'll see the brand new fields. You're going to see it's a now a target of multiple developers. I know at least three or four people looking at uh, uh, considering, depending upon how the zoning finishes out, but these are going to be huge investment spots and should be. Uh, I have, uh, I'm looking myself uh, just down the block there because, because of that. I want it to be walkable. I want this. I think it's going to be an outstanding place. You have historic buildings that can be redone. And, and I find that cosmetic to be just fantastic. And I think most people do. They appreciate that. Columbian Square, very similar. You have a series of historic buildings, some of which have already been converted. The architecture is beautiful over there, looking around at the, the different old buildings, the library, the churches. I mean, absolutely fantastic. You're next to this gigantic employer, which is Social Hospital. Whole Foods is walkable, and you're seeing a series of other things being considered at the same time. So also a target of multiple investors. Zoning changes are being considered, but I think this is a factor coming after Jackson Square is handled. But Columbian Square itself, we're looking at, again, just like Jackson Square, we have your live component, we have your work component, we have your play component. So these things, as simple as it sounds, it's actually a really big factor for attracting people to these areas. 
And again, what we want to do is recognize that a demographic shift is happening and it's going to happen within the state of Massachusetts. The question is whether the South Shore is going to be able to embrace it in a way that takes in these, these young professionals, these people that are changing, altering, and improving our communities, and then allowing us to then sell them houses later on so they stay there and become families that are now take the pride in the South Shore that we already have having grown up here. Oh, and don't forget, if you're building anything, feel free to call Atlantic Mechanical Contractors. <laughs> awesome, Joe. Thank you so much for that. That was a fantastic presentation um, and talking about, um, you know, younger, uh, you know, attracting talent to the, uh, to the South Shore. And I think that um, we, can all, we can all agree that's a, an important uh, resource that we, we, we need to attract down here. Um, last, uh, but certainly not least, uh, I'd like to invite, um, the, the mayor of Quincy, uh, Tom Cope, um, to, uh, to, to the floor and, and talk about some of the projects happening, uh, happening in and around Quincy and, um, Mayor Cope. Thank you, David. Uh, I did not, uh, put together any slide presentation. I'll, I'll be brief, uh, but I always say to anyone out there, anytime you wish to come and visit the office, uh, feel free to do so, reach out. We're glad to give you the tour. We're glad to show you some of the opportunities that we do have uh, in the city. Having said that, uh, for those that uh, aren't quite familiar with Quincy, we're bordered by the Blue Hills on the west, the Atlantic Ocean on the east, and the Fawcett River to the north, and the Weymouth Town River to the south. Uh, John Adams, in writing to Abigail at one point, way back when, when he was in Europe, referred to that spot as the remarkable spot. He misses that remarkable spot. Uh, and you can, if you could picture that land without any buildings on it, it must have been pretty amazing. Still amazing in my view, and uh, we're making some great progress building on our history, building on our infrastructure and what I think we have in Quincy, which is good bones. Uh, interestingly enough, the red line came to Quincy in the late 60s. At the time, the mayor was also the state senator. He was also chairman of transportation. It was a question on the ballot uh, whether we should have the red line come to Quincy. It was non-binding, and it went down 70-30. Uh, regardless, within three years, the red line came to Quincy. And that mayor and state senator had the state pay for all of it. Uh, in addition, which is unique to Quincy, is that we have air rights control over ET property. That's why you don't see any billboards on T property in Quincy. Uh, now, that's also helped us to uh, play in the development. Uh, North Quincy Station, just coming in from Boston, is undergoing a major redevelopment. It was a seven and a half acre asphalt parking lot with now more than 600 units being built, 40,000 square feet of retail. And that's DJ McKinnon, Atlantic Development with Zudo. Uh, it's going very, very well. You come further north, the Wallison station has just been cle completely rebuilt, which was in dire need. It was the last station in all the MBTA without handicap accessibility. Mm -hmm. That's been done. We are now working on an overlay district in Wollaston. We're working with some investors now, uh, actually looking at the eminent domain tool to help move some of these um, uh, blighted uh, spots, if you will, off the map. Uh, and make room for some great new development. Then, of course, the next lineup is Quincy Center, and that's where a lot of the activity has been. Uh, you know, I, I expect that uh, in this this new federal census count, we're going to probably round out at 105 or 110,000 people uh, with additional units. So there's been a lot of growth in Quincy in the housing area for the last decade. Now, that is good because we are dealing with the housing shortage, but there's also the political side. There's a lot of uh, backlash. Uh, to me from some of our neighborhoods, even though it doesn't directly affect the neighborhood, that perception of overdevelopment, more traffic, more people. Uh, so we're always trying to balance that, uh, that argument, if, if you will. But in Quincy Center, we, we have uh, built uh, roughly about 700 new units in the center, uh, some condominium, many apartments. With that comes retail, with that comes a lot of new restaurants. Uh, we have to date spent about $180 million of public dollars uh, through uh, district improvement financing, which I can talk a little bit about later, uh, in order to really attract the private investment, I believe you need the public investment. Um, if you haven't had the chance to come and visit the Hancock Adams Common, we actually took out a section of four lane roadway to Hancock Street and created a beautiful park setting with the First Parish Church on one side, which is the resting place of two presidents and their wives and our own town hall on the other side, right off the Quincy Center Station, which has led to tremendous new values in and around Quincy Center. Uh, continuing along down the, uh, to the south, uh, and, I, and I know that some of you that, certainly Susan, the growing up in Situate, you probably came to Quincy to shop. It was Shoppers Town, USA, 
from the 40s into the mid 70s uh, until the mall came along and well, we know that story. <laughs> so we've, uh, we've been working very hard uh, rezoning OLA district, DIF district, uh, DIF district to uh, give us the tools, if you will, the tool chest to uh, make some serious change. The zoning was the first piece. Uh, actually, I served on the zoning committee with my predecessor uh, and uh, I was pushing for 25 stories in Quincy Center. I didn't quite get my way. It got to 15 and with 20 uh, with special permit. Well, when we did that, we made the planning board the one-stop shopping board to deal with so they don't have to go and deal with ZBA and, and other stops to make it as efficient as we possibly could. Uh, obviously, a lot of changes in the zoning, reducing the amount of parking needed, et cetera, because we're near the, we're near the transit. Uh, I mentioned 700 units. We've got about Another 800 to 1,000 on the plans uh, of residential, both apartment and condominium, but 125 keys for a hotel, uh, but a 180,000 square foot medical office building, which is being worked on by Fox Rock. We expect to be in the ground for, for that and one of the residential buildings by the end of the summer. Uh, and that is on the backside of Hancock Street between Bergen Parkway uh, and Hancock Street, which if you visited the square years ago, it was like an alleyway. It was um, a big garage in the back there that was, wasn't very pretty. Uh, would not have won any architectural awards, that's for sure. That's all gone. We've uh, reclaimed that whole area. We're creating a, a new bridge that's coming over the tracks. It's going to give us more egress in and out. We are updating every uh, water, saw, gas, utility line in the center. We moved to Brook. We built a brand new municipal garage on the other side of Hancock Street for more than 750 cars. It's a really handsome garage with a beautiful new public space with it. Uh, we are creating pocket parks throughout the downtown as we build out the units. As we've learned through the pandemic, people need to get out and walk and enjoy the fresh air, um, whether they're walking the dog, having a smoke, whatever that may be. Uh, so we've made a lot of great progress uh, to date and I expect that momentum to continue. We continue to work with um, our friends at the Quincy Shipyard uh, both Jay Cashman and Dan Cork. There's a lot of potential there, uh, and uh, we'll continue to work we'll work on that. The last transit station is the Quincy Adams Station, which really led to the development of Crown Colony, a uh, beautiful office park, which also has mixed use now with development of uh, both homes as, as well as apartments there uh, as well. So all of it's, it's interesting. I was being criticized about five or 10 years ago. We're, we're relying too much on residential property taxes. You need more commercial. Uh, yet through the pandemic, uh, the residential property values have held and gone up while the commercial has stagnated. Uh, so that has helped me on the, uh, certainly on my property tax levy side, uh, which is not a bad thing. But having said that, we are the home of Boston Scientific and uh, Quincy Mutual Insurance, uh, Beller, Stop and Shop Corp, State Street. We've got a number of major corporate uh, citizens here who are also are involved in the community. Uh, we got about 10,000 kids in the school system. We got uh, 20 schools, uh, eight firehouses, and we're building a new public safety building. And one of the new major projects in the downtown, we have two colleges in Quincy, Eastern Nazarene College and the Quincy College. And uh, we are on the books to build a brand new 16-story uh, building for Quincy College right outside the Quincy Center Station, uh, which is awesome because it is a commuter school, which we do believe, uh, we'll believe, uh, we believe that it will also add to additional economic interest and growth. Uh, we are partnering with some of those hospital entities, some great synergy there with our nursing program and lab tech program at the college, uh, which I think is going to bring some uh, great results in economic benefits to it as well. So um, a lot going on in the city. Which we're, because of the pushback, we are looking at tightening up some zoning and some of those fringe areas, those transitional areas between some of the commercial districts or, you know, between the residential A single family home and what could be a residential C or, uh, business B and so forth. That's been kind of the problematic areas for us uh, when it comes to the political outcry, if you will, of, of some of the development issues. But overall, we're trying to promote it along the spine, along the tracks, along Hancock and Newport Avenues, where it makes sense with the whole transportation oriented development and mantra. And uh, to date, we're, uh, we're thrilled where we're at, but we have, we have a ways to go. I always say to the governor when we're talking is, he says, I sound like a private sector person because I'm always complaining about the permitting process and how archaic it is, how difficult and challenging it is. I mean, some of you may drove by, a, or driven by a police station on 3A across from the Mount Walson Cemetery. A lot of South Shore people come through Quincy going to work in the morning in Boston. And uh, it's all macadam and all these old buildings. And yet uh, DEP had their claw in it 
uh, you know, tying us up for a period of time. To get, you think we were filling in a mosh. I said that to the governor. He said, well, well, that wouldn't be past you to fill in the mosh. I said, well, that's not the case here. But the point is that the permitting has gotten just so crazy. Uh, I, I Sometimes when I guess lecture, I talk about the, the fourth branch of government being bureaucracy and how these people are not accountable to anybody. I'm on the ballot. I'm accountable. Uh, these people have an awful lot of power and say, uh, which has a great impact on what each of you do uh, on your developments, but it also has an impact in many ways on the massive developer in Quincy Center. So I feel your pain when it comes to the permitting stuff, but we're very, very happy with the progress we've made. Uh, it's interesting, Susan, you talked about, you know, being proud, proud of Situate and uh, I think we all feel that way. I never left my street in all Quincy. Uh, you know, in Quincy, you, you know, if you're from Howes Neck, you're not from Quincy, you're from Howes Neck. Right. If you live in Squanum, you're from Squanum, you're not from Quincy. Uh, and we have a lot of those great neighborhoods uh, in our city that really uh, is the strength of our city. So, so that's a great thing. Certainly uh, proud to continue to protect those from some of this you know, development that we want to encourage in the, the more commercial areas. So uh, with that, I'll be happy to stop and I look forward to any questions. Excellent, Mayor Koch. That was fantastic, and thank you. You, you didn't need slides, Mayor Koch. You, you, you really painted a great picture there, so thank you very much. Um, so before we uh, turn it over uh, to some additional q and I've, I've got um, some questions that I'd like to just kind of run through uh, uh, the panelists, and, and um, we can open up some, some more, uh, more discussion that way. So um, this question is addressed to Susan O'Day, um, initially, and if the mayor and Joe, you want to chime in on this, please. Um, we, we've seen a few uh, new distribution centers pop up in the region over the past couple of years. You've got Amazon down in Kingston. You're seeing uh, Peapod in, in Weymouth. For a variety of reasons, uh, some communities have welcomed uh, these changes. Some are more hesitant. Um, how should we be planning uh, for this business model in, in the suburbs? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, you know, what strikes me, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna answer your question, but I'm gonna go sideways for just a moment. What strikes me in this conversation, particularly Joe's comments and the mayor's comments, is again, the, the regional collaboration. I think that's something that the South Shore Chamber of Commerce has driven. I think somewhat it's sort of in the, the water itself because there's shared resources um, and challenges across the region that we've had to sort of collaborate to solve. But there, there are these threads in the private se sector in particular of collaboration. And even though it's not, it's not overt, as Joe said, it's not, you know, sort of, you know, all the developers have gotten a room and said, this is what we're going to do. It's more that um, people who very much care about the region and care about their towns have come together and said, so what are we going to do to uplift the whole area? And it's not that you're going to forfeit the profit of your company in the long run to make that happen because you do need to survive and you have shareholders or family or whomever to service, but you are gonna not always optimize for profit on every decision. So you're gonna look at it short-term and long-term to make sure that, you know, we're, we're really um, stewarding, if you would, this amazing resource in the social. And again, I, I acknowledge I'm new again to the business community here and it's just, it's palpable and it's unique in a way that I haven't seen in other areas. And I think so much of that does go to the chamber and the Economic Development Council and leaders like uh, Mayor Koch. But it's relevant to your question because, you know, distribution centers have been a part of our life forever. I mean, they've always been around. You've always had manufacturing, you've always had distribution. They've always existed and particularly around uh, major thoroughfares, whether that's rail or, or cars. Historically, it's been rail because you're distributing massive bulk input into manufacturing processing. In the last 20 X years, obviously, that has become, thoroughfares become our highways and our roads. And the packages and the warehousing, the stuff we're distributing now are these finite things. Um, over the last two years, we've seen it just, actually more like five years, but we've seen it explode with individual packages where same day delivery, particularly in major metropolitan areas like Boston, have become sort of the norm. And as consumers, we think that this has increased our life's value so much that we have to have everything in a moment. And so you have this great demand for these large package distributions. Um, now we're starting to see through pandemic where you're seeing distribution centers now by individual retailers, which, which I think is very different. And there's sort of two concepts here. There's sort of mass distribution of individual packages from many, many retailers out to the consumer. And then there's very targeted segment specific, for example, grocery 
or you know Peloton, I just noticed opened one. I mean, so there's there's different, much more specific. So I think as developers, um, you know, this has a huge, obviously it has a huge impact on the infrastructure roads because these guys, particularly the national ones who will remain nameless, will come in and consume all the idle capacity. They will max out the idle capacity and block out sort of our mid-range companies who need that same capacity to operate and grow. And that's really from, from a developer standpoint, most of us are dealing with this mid-tier um, industrial or commercial. We're not dealing with these major national firms, although we have a, a fair, you know, Boston Scientific and EMD, we have, you know, some of them here, but the bulk of our businesses are still, you know, small and mid-sized businesses who have built their living here in the South Shore and are serving the region. Um, these, these distribution centers will choke up the roads if we're not thoughtful. And so I think what, if I could, to me, as I've learned in my experience, um, we have a, a zoning uh, or a, a project that is in Hingham that was recently approved. And so I became very familiar with the topic as we you know, participated or tried to participate in, in decisions that Hingham was making around an Amazon last round distribution center is that we need to take a regional approach. We need to watch each other's back. Um, as developers, we need to think about the use of our properties and what are the impacts on our longevity and how do we start partnering with people like Mayor Koch, the state, um, the chamber to really think about what is the optimal sort of size and scale of these centers and let it be driven not just by the profitability of these folks, but by the needs of the region. And we haven't done that yet. We're still looking at it, each town doing it themselves. And as you said, people either love it or hate it. And there's not a lot of gray in between. And I think as um, a region, it's here. I think we could set a model. I think we could make a difference by really engaging positively, whether it's through MAPC or other organizations to really look at what is the optimal size of these things? What's the nature of their use and how do developers, you know, how are they able to be opportunistic as these requests come in? And yet at the same time, really partner with municipalities in a collective way to not shoot each other in the foot. So long answer, apologies, um, but I, I, I would advocate for continued regional focus um, on these things and really get an active dialogue within municipalities with each other because um, we are all gonna shoot each other in the foot here very shortly and it's gonna happen and we won't see it until it's done and then it will be you know, the 19, sort of 60s all over again. So I think we need to, we've gotten ahead of it a bit. Infrastructure is lacking in some areas in the region, but people are focusing on it. Housing people are focusing on getting momentum, but that momentum could be squashed very quickly if we don't get a handle on how we, how we grow this distribution network. Awesome, Susan. Um, thank you for, for that. I think that covers quite a bit. Um, and I just be, due to time, I'd, I'd open the floor to, to Joe and, and to Tom, but I, I'd like to, um, uh, just kind of move forward um, and uh, talk a little bit about the Chamber's uh, you know, 2030 um, housing initiative. Um, and I think you guys can both speak to, to this. Um, as, as part of that uh, 2030 initiative, the Chamber has been advocating for a healthier mix of housing products across the region. Um, one of the, the more successful ways to do that is to encourage more diverse housing stock uh, and, and through zoning changes and encouraging, you know, mix, mixes of uses um, and creating areas. And Joe, you talked a lot about this, um, do, but do you see any shifts in the communities that you work in or represent? Are there any uh, zoning changes? Uh, 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 Tom, I think you talked a little bit about those as well, zoning changes in Quincy that we can kind of highlight and use as a, as use, use as a model. Yeah, um, uh, certainly, uh, you know, with the downtown, we created the urban redevelopment district, and then we created a district improvement financing. We're currently doing an overlay of the Wellison district. Now, the downtown obviously is is a uh, is an area that we want to promote far more density. Uh, Wollaston, I know Joe alluded to Weymouth, the village type concepts, Wallace and North Quincy, we got some of those little smaller commercial areas that have a better, more of a village feel. So we don't want to be putting 15 or 20 story buildings in, and we, we want to create that transition. So it may be some five over podium, maybe in the core of the, the center be 10 stories in Wollaston. And then you drop down as you transition back into the single family homes. Unfortunately in Quincy, we don't have any room for big tracts of land to build single family homes. So the bulk of our uh, development has been uh, mostly apartment, but condominium as well. 
a density, uh, limited parking to take advantage of public transportation. Uh, and kind of that's the direction we've gone. And I know we need all of it. Uh, and uh, Peter and I have had many conversations over, over the years about this. And, um, you know, I deal with the Metro mayors around the um, core of Boston in dealing with the housing shortage as well. Uh, but it's, it's tricky because it's that balance, as I said earlier, about people saying uh, there's some people just don't like change. You know, I, actually, a woman had said to me at the same time, there's too much building going on. Where's my kid going to afford to live? And I said, think about what you just said to me. You know, we need these options so these young professionals can continue to live in their community and stay close to the, the core of Boston. So um, if anybody has any specific questions on zoning, we, we can uh, we can connect you what's worked for us. You reach out to me directly, our office. We can connect with our planning department and get in a little more detail. Um, you know, and I think you're going to ask me a little bit later. I'll hold off on the district improvement piece. That's a, a great tool. Yeah, and maybe you want to. Um, uh, well, I'll let, I want to let Joe uh, take the take the floor on that that question first. Then I'll circle back on on the uh, district improvement financing. Yeah, I mean it's 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 very similar. So uh, Weymouth did a good job of doing the uh, zoning with say the Village Overlay District, which was Weymouth Landing. Uh, I mean, you're extending the building height, you're, you're, you're allowing special permits so they can have some planning board interference to see what it is they want to put in there without having to go straight to variance when you're getting into multiple units, uh, sort of in density requirements. I mean, Bob Luongo and, and Mayor Hedlund, um, Bob Luongo, the head of the planning board, have done a, a fantastic job of being able to, to create these, the zoning within these particular village areas that have allowed them to, to really have, again, a strategic component in putting these things together. So... Um, you know, raising building height and then allowing greater density within certain zones, especially as it surrounds the uh, transit. And, and that has now been uh, embraced in the, the latest governor's uh, uh, housing bill that was uh, passed earlier in January, where they, they actually now, uh, I believe they, they distribute funding in accordance with the amount of density being allowed within a half mile of each one of the uh, MBTA stations. So th these, these, these types of things not only open up access to, to additional funding for the towns, but uh, it, it, again, will be able to give them greater control over what's going in those areas while still attracting the developers. So the, the zoning is a huge, huge piece and a huge tool for, for towns that are actually looking to, to have a goal. And the mayor has probably got a better, better grasp on this, but knowing where you want to be in five years, that you have to take steps toward that. Um, it, it's not something that's just going to accidentally happen. You know, this sort of uh, unspoken conspiracy I keep talking about has more to do with setting up a stage environment for these things to develop, as opposed to hoping that it happens on its own because of geography. Uh, you know, we can create that environment uh, by working together. And that's, a, that's across the region, like Susan said, across the region and being able to, to work together to be able to create an environment where the South Shore now has better zoning for where they care for it, and then be able to preserve the residential communities where they matter. So the zoning in these areas is, is essential. Whereas leaving that alone or hoping that developers now apply for variances in zones that you don't want the control. I mean, you want to funnel these places, the, the, the investment to where they belong. So that's really the key here. Right. Right. Perfect. Joe, thank you. I, I know we've got a lot of questions um, uh, coming from the audience and I, I know um, I want to address some of the other items here, but I think we can do that within the Q and a um, um, uh, time that we have uh, left. So, uh, Courtney, do you want to um, open it up and we can um, hear some questions from uh, the rest of the audience and, and have the panelists answer? Sure, absolutely. Um, thank you all very much for your comments and your presentations. Um, super interesting information and helpful overview of the region. Um, we do have a good amount of questions coming in from the audience, so I'm going to go ahead and get to as many of them as we can. Um, and what we don't get to, we'll try and get you answers to. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just kick it off with one of the first ones. Um, what sort of investment in digital infrastructure is happening in the South Shore area? Anyone want to take that? Well, I can speak to the city of Quincy. I mean, we certainly right. I alluded to the, to the new bridge. Um, we're spending tens of millions of dollars a year in new water mains on sewer lines. Not only is the system old, but we're trying to incre increase capacity so that we can accommodate these new dense developments in, in certain parts of our city. Uh, we're, we're spending some serious money on seawalls as we're dealing with the climate issue with 27 miles of coastline. Uh, but again, uh, you know, for planning, you really need to look at your infrastructure, uh, both roads, but also it's, it's not sexy to talk about. And, but, you know, when you're placing water mains and soil lines, nobody cares unless the water isn't coming on in your house. 
So you don't get a lot of political points for it, but it's essential in anything you're going to do in the development side, particularly expansion. Great. Great, thanks. Does anyone have any thoughts on digital infrastructure? Um, broadband, I'm assuming, something like for that? The, for the most part, and I don't, I'm out, way out over my skis, but, and Joe may have better, especially knowing from Weymouth, but I mean, so much of that is dependent on private industry coming in based on the market. And so they have, you know, the ability to come in with digital infrastructure is a whole lot easier than what the mayor just spoke about coming in with sewer lines and power. Um, again, does involve trenching, does involve all of these, you know, requirements, but the cost, the barriers to go in are much less than, than what we're talking about. And there's, you know, a fairly competitive digital environment on the Southeast have, or Northeast rather, where you have multiple digital carriers here competing for business. And so, I don't know, Joe, what your experience was with Union Point or some of the areas in Weymouth. I mean, you know, the it's we have what Comcast and Verizon essentially competing for the, the the digital sphere as far as it goes for access to internet. And again, this is a private industry, but it's, it's it's maintained like a utility. That's that's a level above really on a town basis. I think that goes to really a state level as to how those things are being approached. Um, as density increases, yeah, it becomes a lot more appealing for these companies to be able to offer better incentives. I know. Um, Comcast offers, I think, a, a rebate of like fifty dollars uh, per unit uh, to get access and become the exclusive provider per building, and that becomes them then appealing there. But you also want to make sure that you know that one of the first things I get asked is, do you offer Wi-Fi for this area? Is it free in the common areas? Does your roof deck get Wi-Fi? I mean, these are all things that, that that people start to care about how much access they get to to the internet and to the to data, and then it becomes now almost a paid for amenity for landlords to consider. Um, and then as that increases, you want to make sure that you're offering the best options. You know, you're not just going to put Verizon or Comcast on the foreground just because, okay, this is one that uh, they gave me the best deal. That doesn't matter if it has the slowest internet and, you know, half the people are now working from home and their Zoom conferences start cutting out here and there. So it's, it's just not going to work. So it's, it's a hard thing for us to talk about because, you know, that's a level really, I think above, um, you know, that I have access to for decision making for how they get involved. But the more and more that we create a, a demand for it, the more that the private environment is going to adapt to it. Awesome, thank you both. Um, I'm gonna try and combine these two questions around life sciences. Um, what, okay, maybe I'll just start with this one. With life sciences, biotech being one of the leading vertical markets in Massachusetts, what is the South Shore's plan to attract these tenants and businesses to our area? Um, maybe, I mean, Dave and Susan, and obviously the yeah. mayor, uh, Joe, if you have anything to add to this from like a, you know, commercial real estate. I think the, the mayor and, and Joe both, both touched on this a little bit. I think um, uh, uh, mayor talked about uh, two colleges in uh, the city of Quincy. And I think uh, it goes back to education. Uh, you get some investment in some of the education infrastructure with the new, uh, the new building going up for Quincy College. Uh, I think that's vitally important to bring uh, the mines uh, to, to our region. And, um, and, and then Joe, I think you talked a little bit um, about how these zoning efforts in the, in the development um, is leading to a, you know, a younger, younger workforce um, for, you know, that's being attracted to the region. And I think that's important in, in bringing these types of industries uh, to the region. Um, can you can you cite one major uh, biotech or life science company that has uh, that has come down here beyond the EMD Serono's? I think you can uh, pick some smaller smaller companies, smaller anecdotes of uh, uh, biotech where they're trying to get closer to uh, to where they maybe they live, and, and, and um, but there hasn't been that sort of major uh, player that's that's relocated down here. Uh, but maybe maybe the mayor, you can talk a little bit about. Um, some some examples. Sure. Uh, obviously, Boston Scientific here doesn't hurt us uh, with that marquee. Uh, but we do have some smaller ones we're negotiating with now. Uh, Quincy has uh, come on the screen a little bit now. Uh, it's, we're a little cheaper to operate than Cambridge and Boston. Um, you know, a few years ago, we got a federal grant to offer a special program to train technicians in that world. So we get Quincy College graduates going right into that world. It's not the sophisticated R&D piece, but you know you need physicians at every level and that's been helpful. And the discussions we're having with the hospital entities coming, I think will lead to some great synergies with some 
uh, additional interest with life science biotech, seeing this a uh, little bit of a medical college cluster in the downtown, I think will be attractive. So that's, uh, that's the plan anyway. Great, thank you. Um, okay, I'm gonna jump around a little bit. Stephen uh, Dierner has a question. What are the areas of the South Shore that the panel would recommend for new investors to look into? I know the mayor's answer. <laughs> the business I'll, just say, I'll, I'll just say Quincy, you did such a great job. <laughs> Call Any us. Well, any one of us, and we can have that conversation. Yeah, I think that's a very broad okay. use. Depend, depending on what the investment is, I think there's a lot of answers there. I think uh, you know, happy to talk to anybody outside of the um, uh, this forum and uh, and talk about that. Okay, got it. Okay, and then I have one person who had a hand raised earlier. I don't know if he's still here. Jack, maybe is he still here? No. Okay, I have one, a couple more questions. What are towns doing specifically that make developers want to work in those towns? So you, I mean, you and I can probably learn. Dave. I mean, I, yeah. I, I just gave a whole presentation on that. Yeah. I think, yeah. yeah, I know. I think, yeah, you know, Joe probably had the best uh, in, in terms of looking at the uh, the region. I think, uh, you know, the, the city of Weymouth has done a fantastic job, as Joe highlighted, with the, the zoning overlays and um, and really attracting development because they see that there's a market for development. Um, it's just, you know, creating those areas where you can um, you can build a, you know, mixed use and, and they've got these corridors where they can do that. So. Uh, I think, you know, stuff, zoning is definitely a factor. Um, and I think infrastructure is, is definitely a factor. And, 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 and maybe just kind of adding on to that question, um, you know, um, you know, water, wastewater capacity is a huge challenge in, in the region and um, something that the chamber has really focused on. Um, I guess I want to ask the panelists, you know, what are some of the solutions and tools that the, the towns could, you know, and the cities and towns could, could use to, uh, to, to solve some of these challenges with, with water and wastewater. And I know, Susan, you know, um, you know, the South Shore Industrial Park, maybe you can talk a little bit about that in terms of water, wastewater. Yeah, I mean, so it's, it is a challenge and it's been a perpetual challenge for a long time. And it becomes really unique when you sit at the nexus of multiple towns. Um, and we have a building actually that spans Hingham and Rockland, literally. And so, at this point is, is still, you know, some of, some of this is private, some of this is municipal, some of it is state, some of it is private, meaning the developers build, um, you know, their own septic systems and things of that sort. So um, I think the, there is not a good answer right now, other than each, right now, each solution is bespoke, where you have to negotiate each one and to figure out who's got the capacity and who's willing to sell you that capacity so that you can use it. The work that's going on that you just mentioned or uh, Courtney mentioned with the chamber is really trying to take, again, a regional approach to say, what is the future development that's happening within the region? What are gonna be, I think, five or six projects that are examples or, or atypical of what's coming? And then trying uh, or will lay out what are the alternatives for the region? And I think what we've seen, and it's similar to roads, and I think the mayor's seen it, if, you, if we take a regional approach or this is the thesis anyways, if we take a regional approach to funding, we're more likely to get a bigger dollars from either the state or federal government, as opposed to kind of digging in and just trying to put a new trench in, you know, this location or that location. So um, it, when you talk about labs that I, I wasn't gonna chime in, but that's a huge issue, um, you know, to make sure that you have the infrastructure, particularly water, um, to be able to deal with the needs depending on the nature of the use. But um, so I, I don't, you know, again, each one's a bespoke solution, each one's a negotiation, um, building relationships, making sure you have the economics of the project. And it ultimately comes down to, you know, what are you going to invest to either buy from someone or build capacity um, yourself as part of that and contribute to that town. Maybe you can uh, add, add to that with the district improvement financing. Yes. It might be a possibility in certain towns, but it's another tool uh, the state allows. So we created within the urban redevelopment district, we created a DIF district, DIF, the district improvement financing. Now the beauty of that tool is it allows you to take the new tax revenues from that district and separate them into a pot. Mm -hmm. Then it doesn't have to be a new business. It just could be the, the result of the new values. 
Now, then that part then can be used for infrastructure improvements. Right. So uh, we we have had bonded uh, hundreds of millions of dollars at this point on against that to do the parking garage, the water, the, the sewer. Uh, I think Joe Carroll's on from National Grid. They're doing the gas. Uh, the other utility uh, issues, um, the parks, the pocket parks, the, the streetscapes, the hardscapes. And, and I know you're talking about uh, solutions on perhaps wastewater. It could be used for that as well. Uh, so I would definitely look into uh, that tool. It could it could work for some communities. Maybe there's not enough, uh, you know, meat for other communities. But it's definitely a tool that I'd be happy to, anyone wants to follow up and talk to me privately about, give you some advice on. That's great. Thank you, Mayor Koch. Um, yeah, I think if um, if that's it, do you have any other questions, Courtney? Um, um, we have one last question and then we'll wrap up for the day. So um, let's, let's just take that one real quick. Understand Susan spoke to this a bit, but where do you see single family develop, developments taking place in neighborhoods around the South Shore? Slash, where do you see that fitting into the overall economic development strategy in the region, I think? I want to chime in on this for just two seconds. Yeah. I, think, um, I think the over overarching theme that we've all shared today is that there's uh, there's a dichotomy in the in, in our region, and in in, um, you've got landmass on the one side, and you've got urbanization on the other side. And I think at the um, to to kind of summarize what Joe and the mayor and Susan talked about, there's got to be regional collaboration um, between you know. The, the, the cities and some of the towns that uh, that support it, not just from industrial development and distribution centers, but from single family homes. And um, there's a place there's a place for that. It's probably not in the city of Quincy where you, you've got to have more density. Um, but uh, in some of the other towns that we've uh, we've talked about, and there's got to be zoning that 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 can kind of um, get a little bit more to to, to what Weymouth's doing and and creating these these areas where. Um, you've got uh, live, work, play. You've got some transit-oriented development, um, but the, there's there's people that, that want to raise families in, the, in in this region, and they want to have a single, you know, they want to live in a home, and they want to have some land, they want to have a backyard, um, and they should have a place to, to to do that as well. So, I think, um, Dave, that that you know what, what, exactly what you're saying, where we have this big green space in the urbanization, that that in between the two of those, that nexus is where you're going to see your single-family developments. This is sort of expanded out and beyond these urbanized uh, uh, smaller communities there. And they get to take advantage of some of the amenities that are on these first floors, these restaurants, they get to patronize these places. So uh, that's a big piece. I mean, speaking from a, a mechanical contractor where all I do is, is see bids for different things that are being put up all over and that includes single family builders. I mean, we're looking at, we see a lot in Hanson, Whitman, Abington, uh, Duxbury, Marshfield, all these zones we're seeing a lot of building take place. And, and this is happening and has been happening pretty much under this trend for the last 30, 40 years. You know, my parents moved to Norwell uh, a long time ago and uh, you know, they got that for a very small plot. Now it's very expensive. And uh, what ends up happening is further out from each one of these urban communities, we are creating a demand for single family homes. And that's why you're gonna see Whitman and Hans and some of these other zones start to get built up that have a lot of land, but, you know, not normally going to have access to, say, um, those homes that are now starter family homes um, that used to be the Norwell and Hanovers of the area. Um, you know, Weymouth and others have those areas as well. So you're going to see those pockets get filled in as a result of that. But I think you're going to see the expansion mostly in those areas for the next uh, coming years. And I know everyone's looking right now. This is the craziest market ever. Um, but that's going to start happening. Kingston, Plymouth. Pretty much along the Route 3 corridor, I think you're going to see just a lot of those single family building. And then they're going to start seeing their own development of microurbanization pretty much around um, Plymouth Harbor and otherwise it's already happening. Um, but as those areas like Kingston start to see more and more single family homes arise, there's going to be more of a demand for housing in that area. And we're going to see the cycle sort of continue over and over again. Yeah. And hopefully the inventory, I mean, we're seeing it just in projects that we're looking at when we do think about single family they're much more modest. They're not the big McMansions that we've seen sort of blow across the region for the last 30 yes. years or 50 years. And so, you know, really getting the right sizes and the right locations. And that's what families are wanting now. They don't, some may still have the vision of the Gigantor, you know, $2,000 a month heating bill. But um, for the most part, people want realistic, tight, you know, economical, safe, secure houses. So hopefully it, it, normal it sizes. $2,000 a month heating bill if you upgrade your furnace. Uh, <laughs> there you go. Where's the ad? We need the phone number again. No shame, Joe. No shame. 
no shame at all, Joe. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. I think that pretty much wraps up. We're, we're just hitting that 1130 mark. So um, thank you. I, this was incredible um, to, to listen to, to this panel. And um, thank you again to, uh, to Courtney for, for setting this up and, and Peter Foreman and the rest of the chamber. And uh, of course, uh, the one and only Rick Kaplan. <laughs> You're on. <laughs> thank you, Dave. And a lot of people say, thank God there's only one of me. <laughs> I want to thank everyone for attending today. Uh, we had a, a great crowd out there. Fantastic information. I'm, I'm born and raised on the South Shore, so, you know, I'd love to hear about all that. You know, doing these events all over the New England area and in New York, you know, I get a little, uh, you know, they're trying to figure out what we're doing over on the South Shore here, and they're trying to steal some of our stuff, you know, so hate putting it all out there to them, but, you know, it's all good. And, you know, we are doing a great job on the South Shore, and the South Shore Chamber uh, is a fantastic organization because they pull all of you together, you know, so it becomes a, a way that we can collaborate as uh, developers or uh, cities and municipalities and all of that, uh, which makes this a little easier than uh, some other parts of the state. I want to thank our sponsors for today. I also want to thank all of our speakers, the mayor making the time to, to do this this morning and the rest of you also. Uh, I want to thank you for that. I want to thank our sponsors for this morning. Platinum Sponsors, Ellis Realty Advisors, A.W. Perry, Atlantic Mechanical Contractors, our gold sponsors, Acela Construction Corporation, Rockland Trust Bank, Jack Conway Realtor, Green International Affiliates, Inc., Axiom Architects, Norell Services, Inc., our corporate sponsors, Inspire Technology, U.S. Pavement, Cape Cod 5, First Citizens, Platinum Partners, LLC, and Northmark. And I want to, before we leave, I want to, give you all a message from uh, A.W. Perry with a short video. And I hope you all enjoy that. And I hope to see you all next week. One, two, three, go. Fred, here with my colleague, Tyler Hilson. We are members of the Perry CRE Advisory Group on the South Shore. We're part of a team of 12 people focused on providing advisory services to companies throughout the greater Boston area. With a particular focus on the South Shore. Over the last three years, we have been involved in transactions totaling over 1 million square feet on behalf of landlords and tenants covering all product types, including office, medical, retail, industrial, and land. We bring a level of experience and focus to every project that we believe assures successful outcomes for each of our clients. Today, we are staging this video in front of one of our newest office listings on behalf of A.W. Perry. Four Pond Park is a newly renovated three-story, 28,000 square foot facility located here in the South Shore Park in this beautifully landscaped setting. With brand new systems throughout, this is a great opportunity for any company looking to create a modern headquarters in a healthy environment. So if your business is facing a decision about whether to lease, buy, or sell real estate, or simply how to more effectively use your existing facility or space, please give us a call. We would welcome the chance to put our expertise to work on your behalf.